Well, this is Dean Harold Wilmington, and you're listening to the 240th tape of the Liberty Home Bible Institute. Now, normally I'm in a soundproof studio by myself, trying to preach and teach to some empty seats, but not this morning. Uh, we're sort of a live service here today, and we're in the uh, auditorium here of the Thomas Road Bible Institute. I wish you could see all these uh, wonderful looking fellows and gals. I see there's a couple of ugly ones here. I see Fred over there. And what we're going to do is sort of tie in the Thomas Road Bible Institute uh, curriculum today uh, with that of the Liberty Home Bible Institute. And so we want you to join us in singing a song. Now they're standing, and you may stand also, now if you're seated in the car, maybe you better not. But uh, we're going to sing a grand song by Fanny Crosby, and this is dedicated to all of our students, to you and to we that are here. Number 227, To God Be the Glory. <clears throat> to God be the glory, great things he That's great singing. Now I'm going to ask the Associate Dean, the Thomas Road Bible Institute, to come and lead us in prayer.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for thy blessing. We thank thee for thy marvelous grace. We thank thee for thy blessed Son that has come into the world to provide a salvation for us. We praise thee, our God, for all thy love, for the marvelous things that thou hast done for us. We thank you for the Thomas Road Bible Institute. We pray thy blessing upon uh, Dr. Wilmington. We pray thy blessing upon the students here in the Thomas Road Bible Institute. We pray, Father, for all those who are taking it out in their homes, who are taking it by correspondence. We pray, our Father, that you will bless their lives and use them in a marvelous way to give a testimony of this marvelous grace of our loving God wherever they are. May they, through their study, be able uh, to give a good account of what they have learned. We thank you for all your blessings and praise your name and look forward to the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. This is the last lecture of the Thomas Road by our, the Liberty Home Bible Institute, and we're making it in front of the class of the Thomas Road Bible Institute. And among the other folks that are here today is our pastor. And we love him, and he introduced the first, and I think he ought to introduce the last. And so, Pastor, if you'll come now, and to show you how much we love him, we have a little traveling music for him as he comes. students and be seated. Only Dr. Harold Wilmington and his staff would think of something like this. But uh, I'm honored to, to be here today and introduce the last of 400 wonderful lectures on the Word of God comprising what we know as Liberty Home Bible Institute. So when we first began to dream about transferring what was happening here in your classroom onto tape and the printed page and enlisting thousands of people around the world who could never come to Lynchburg and to Thomas Road Bible Institute. It all seemed a dream. We thought it sounds logical and it sounds reasonable, but can it really be done? Dr. Wilmington said it could be done. So he set out on the unbelievably difficult task of producing 400 lectures on tape and directing the production of those tapes. Others have assisted him somewhat in it. And of taking time to think out, plan out, pray out, and write out enough material so that a graduate of Liberty Home Bible Institute would indeed be a Bible college graduate. But it has been done. This is the last of those 400 lectures. And Dr. Wilmington and I were talking about the program initially and introducing the initial uh, messages. We had hoped by the time we had completed the material that was going into the Institute, we'd have at least 2,000 students enrolled in Liberty Home. The fact is we've now approached 4,000 at this moment, and we foresee the day when there'll be 50,000 students, even 100,000 students in every corner of this globe. I believe that Bible teaching is very near and very dear to the heart of God. He said, my word will not return unto me void. And I believe this propagation of the word of God in the preached word and in the taught word has already accomplished many miracles and many lives, but in the years to come, I believe, will produce literally thousands of souls for the kingdom. The fact is that per capita, the Thomas Road Bible Institute has produced more church builders and church planters than any of our other schools per capita. And I foresee that trend continuing. I foresee the day when this Bible Institute in residence uh, will be really the leading church builder in our school system, including the college, the seminary, and so on. But I also see the prospect of Liberty Home Bible Institute contributing to that. 
There are so many good men out there who will never physically be able to come to Lynchburg to study as you are here in the classroom today. Yet hearing what you're hearing and seeing what you're seeing, God can speak to them, train them, polish them, and then one day we'll begin hearing reports from those men and those women out there who are preaching and teaching. We need good, godly women to teach the Word and to stand by the men of God in the school systems, the Christian day schools, etc. So as pastor of Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, I want to say congratulations to Dr. Harold Wilmington, the dean of Thomas Road Bible Institute and Liberty Home Bible Institute. I think of all the Bible teachers that I know in the world, and I know some good ones. God has more particularly endowed him with the gift of summarizing Scripture than any other man alive today. No one else, I feel, humanly speaking, uh, could have been God's instrument in Liberty Home Bible Institute but Harold Wilmington. So I say congratulations to you, Dr. Wilmington, and to all the students here today of Thomas Road Bible Institute and of the literal thousands who are now enrolled in Liberty Home Bible Institute and unseen thousands who down the road will be hearing what we're saying right now. Congratulations because you're studying the Bible. Congratulations because you're listening to God. And congratulations because you're willing to enlist the service of the king and heed his commission. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. God bless you. Now to help in this uh, celebration, we're going to have the Institute Singers sing one of the most beautiful songs ever written, Worthy is the Lamb.
amen to that I can add. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And I can think of no better song uh, than to end these lectures. We began nearly two years ago. Then that song, Worthy is the Lamb. You remember the threefold definition or the threefold summarization of the entire Bible. In Genesis 22, Isaac asked the question, Where is the Lamb? In John chapter 1, John the Baptist answers that question, Behold the Lamb. And in Revelation 5, then the angels worship him, saying, Worthy is the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 20, and we have chapters 20, 21, and 22 to summarize in about 20 minutes here. We read these words, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, this is, of course, the beginning of the millennium, that 1,000-year reign of Christ. Many years there have been political and religious systems and personages that have come along, and they have said, allow us to do our thing, and we can bring in the millennium. But they've never been able to, and they never will be able to. But someday, one is coming to defeat the devil at the Battle of Armageddon. He's going to have a name on his vesture and his thigh, and this name is going to read King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's going to usher in this long-anticipated, long-looked-for 1,000-year reign. But before he does that, he's going to have to make certain changes. And one thing he's going to have to do, of course, is to get rid of the devil, at least uh, to imprison the devil. Someone has asked the question, if God is all-wise, why did he create the devil? And if God is all powerful, why doesn't he destroy the devil? The answer to that question is, God didn't, but he will. He did not make the devil. He made an angel whose name was Lucifer, who became the devil, but God will someday destroy, that is to say, put out of his sight the devil throughout all eternity. But now he limits him and his sphere of activity to the heart of the earth, to the bottomless pit. And then in verse 3, he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. John says, And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. By the way, John sees me. Does he see you up on those thrones, one of those thrones? If you're a child of God, he does, because Jesus said someday we'll rule with him. And the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Know ye not that we shall judge the world, and we'll judge angels. And now John sees what Paul had predicted. He sees this. And in verse, the last part of verse 4, uh, we read this, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The word thousand is mentioned six times here in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. If God didn't mean a thousand years, I wonder why he didn't say what he did mean. Now, if we take the Bible literally, we must take this literally and not go along with all millennialism that says there is no millennium or post-millennialism that says that Christ will come after the millennium. The Bible teaches the pre-millennial return of Christ, that Christ will return to institute the millennium. Verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. That is to say, this is the first of two resurrections that will happen at this time. One after Armageddon, right before the millennium, and the other after the millennium. So you have a resurrection before the millennium and a resurrection after the millennium. The resurrection before the millennium is the resurrection of the just. And that includes all 
those that were killed in the Lord during the tribulation, and I believe also all those who have died from the time of Adam on through the first, uh, first appearance of Christ. The Old Testament saints will be resurrected at this time. Blessed and holy, verse 6, is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Now, in verse 7, and when the thousand years are ended, now John doesn't go into all the details of what will take place during the millennium. You can read in the Old Testament on that. You can read the book of Isaiah, especially the last 15 or 20 chapters. You can read passages in Jeremiah and in the Psalms, Habakkuk and Zephaniah, Haggai, Joel, Amos. There are many passages, many books that speak about this glorious time. But after the thousand years are ended, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Someone asked Dr. Lewis Sperry Schaefer, the founder and first president of Dallas Theological Seminary, well, I can't believe this. Uh, he said, why does the Lord allow the devil to get loose when he has him here at the beginning of the millennium? And Schaefer said, I'll answer that when you answer me the question why he let him loose the first time. Well, I think the answer to both those questions is found in Revelation 4, verse 11. Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were and are created. That is to say that God, everything God does, he does for his glory and for the good of the elect. And in some strange way, this gives him some unexplainable way, he gets glory out of this, and that's why anything happens. Now, when Satan is loose from the bottomless pit, he gathers an army, the number of which is as the sands of the sea. Where does this army come from? It comes from those people who have grown up during the millennium. You see, apparently there will be a number of saved Gentiles and Jews that will escape the tribulation. They'll be saved, and they'll escape the wrath of the Antichrist. He won't be able to kill them all, you see. So they'll be allowed to go into the millennium, with uh, not glorified bodies, as the believer, the saints will have, the resurrected saints at the rapture, but these will have bodies perhaps as Adam and Eve had. And they'll live forever, but they'll be able to, uh, to uh, repopulate the earth. And they will do that. And millions of children will be born. Some of these children will grow up and accept Christ, who will be ruling in Jerusalem. Some will not. And that's why he'll rule with a rod of iron. So for a thousand years, or for many years, these unsaved will give lip service to Jesus, but they'll secretly be shaking their fist at him in their pockets, and their hearts will not belong to him. Uh, some uh, reminds us of those who many times people go to church. They force their children, which they should, should have our children go to church, but they go to church and they never get saved. And uh, so this is possibly probably what happens. At any rate, after the millennium, the devil's loosed, and then he goes about and he deceives the world and he gathers this great army. I think one of the purposes for the millennium is this, to prove a point. And the point is this, that in spite of the fact that you might live in the perfect environment, you still need to be born again. And at any rate, in verse 9, you have now the final battle in the, the Bible, but it really isn't a battle at all because uh, Satan doesn't even get one lick in. The Bible says that the fire comes down from heaven and completely devours them and destroys them. And then the devil that deceived them, verse 10, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then in verses 11 through 15, you have the great white judgment throne. These are very fearful verses for unsaved people. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it from whose face and earth the heaven and uh, the whose from from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and whosoever verse 15 was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire and then after the great white judgment throne is over, after the millennium is over, and after the judgment of angels will be over, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Something very important happens 
between chapters 20 and 21 of the book of Revelation. You might want to put 2 Peter chapter 3 in that little space because the events in that chapter take place here. Peter describes the time when the very rocks and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the world will be destroyed. That will happen after the millennium, after the great white judgment throne. Now John sees a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Some 77% of the surface of the planet earth is covered now by water. This really should be called the planet water instead of the planet earth. But now there will be no more sea. The sea in the Bible is often a type of unrestlessness I mean of un of restlessness it's a type of of uh, sin and wickedness the wicked are like the waves of the sea but there'll be no more sea now because there'll be no more wickedness and I John saw verse 2 the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. See, even during the millennium, there will be some tears. And now all tears are being wiped away. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Well, the final part of the book of Revelation now is given over to a description of the heavenly city. Do you remember we said that the book of Revelation is a book about a lamb? The first three chapters we read about the witnesses of the lamb, the seven churches. Revelation 4 and 5, the worship of the lamb. Revelation 6 to 19, the wrath of the lamb. Revelation 20, the reign of the lamb. He rules for a thousand years. And now in Revelation 21 and 22, the wife of the lamb, that is the church, of course. And what a present he gives his bride, this wonderful bridegroom. He gives her a, not a five-carat or a 50-carat diamond, but he gives her an entire city. And we know something about this city. Uh, this city is four square. Now, it may be, in verse 16, the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as a breadth. And he measured the city. So we know something of the shape of the city. It's either in a, it's a pyramid, it has a four square base, or a cube. And then the city, we know something of the size. John measured it with his reed. It's 12,000 furlongs, and that's approximately 1,500 miles. You have a city 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. And then there is a wall around the city, and... Uh, this wall has 12 gates, three on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. And the Bible says that the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are written on the gates, and each gate is made of a solid pearl. The walls are made of jasper, and we are told in the book of Psalms that the towers of heaven are made of ivory, and here in Revelation, again, we're told that the streets are paved with transparent gold. What a glorious city this is. In verse 18, the building of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. And then in Revelation 22, well, let me read in verse 20, uh, 22 of chapter 21, And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb is the lamp of it. And the nations of them who are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither he that worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So this beautiful city is actually a satellite city. No, I'll change that. The earth is a satellite earth, and the earth will revolve around the city. And we'll have access to the city, and we'll have access to the earth. And we'll have 
this access all through eternity. Chapter 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Remember from our study of Genesis, the tree of life appeared in, in Genesis chapter 3 for the first, Genesis chapter 2 for the first time, and now it reappears, then it disappears in Genesis 3. We never read about it. And now it reappears for the first time, apparently to abide with men forever. And this tree bore 12 kinds of fruit. Will we eat in heaven? We won't have to, but I assume we will. Jesus ate in his glorified body. We'll have a body like Jesus, 1 John 3. We won't have to eat, but we will be able to eat. And verse 3, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Yes, we will serve Jesus in heaven. Uh, there will be far more involved than some disembodied spirits sitting around on clouds with crowns and harps and doing nothing. Heaven will be a place of fulfillment and a place of activity, a place of learning, a place of singing, and here a place of service. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, the final warning in the Bible is found in this chapter, and this is the warning. And all of our liberal friends and all of the cultists need to carefully read verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man, John says, that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. I think he's referring not only, at least in the mind of the Spirit of God, to the book of Revelation, but to the entire Bible, because this is the final book in the Bible. And so we can actually extend that, not only to re from, Gen from Revelation here, but go all the way back to Genesis that if anyone shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. That's what the cults do, you see. They add to the Word of God. They say, oh, yes, we believe in the Bible plus the works of Mary Baker Eddy, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Yes, we believe in the Bible plus the works of Joseph Smith, the Mormon Bible. And we believe in the Bible plus the works of Charles Taze Russell, studies in the Scriptures, the Jehovah Witness Bible. We believe plus. Salvation is faith plus nothing. So that is a warning to the cults. And then in verse 19, you have a warning to the liberals. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. That's what the liberals do. They take away the virgin birth. They take away the vicarious atonement of Christ. They take away the literal bodily resurrection of Christ. They take away the concept of justification by faith. They take away special creation. God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. He who testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Then you have the final prayer in the Bible in this chapter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I can think of no better way to end this series by quoting the words of the diadem. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall, hail him who saved you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. This completes the lectures covering the final New Testament epistles, Unit 4. You may now take your midterm exam. You will find it in the exam packet marked Midterm E1. After all midterm exams have been taken for Units 3 and 4, you may proceed to the final exam covering Units 3 and 4. This exam will be found in the final exam packet 
and should be taken in the presence of your proctor.